Relations Manager, and welcome to today's afternoon session. Louder. Yeah. Welcome to today's afternoon session, uh, Seismic Functional Recovery, Possibilities Explained. And I have been working very closely with the subject of seismic functional recovery, along with many others, uh, especially along the West Coast. We have been in the news quite a bit with seismic activity. I think you've heard that uh, we had an earthquake in Ridgecrest in July, a couple of them, and there was a major earthquake in Anchorage, Alaska. We've been celebrating the 30-year anniversary of the Loma Prieta earthquake and the 25-year anniversary of the Northridge earthquake. And building codes have been under a lot of scrutiny lately with respect to how much protection they provide. What exactly are we designing for with our building codes for seismic design? And it is for life safety. So it's for protecting the occupants of the building that they can safely exit the building. In the media, they have questioned that philosophy. Yeah, yeah, I it. Yes, 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 yes. And I would like to share with you a few quotes that uh, have made their way back to ICC staff. And uh, this is one. What we have are buildings that won't kill you. But if it's a total financial loss, well, that was your financial choice to make. We're creating disposable buildings. Historically, we have had life safety as the code minimum, in which people would be able to exit and people shouldn't die in new buildings. But if we look at economic survivability, it is not enough. What happens to our whole regional economy when residential buildings cannot be reoccupied, when people cannot go into offices for an extended period of time? These are serious questions. I have a few more. The current minimum requirements for construction allow new buildings to be so severely damaged in a major earthquake that they must be torn down. Not sure I agree with that one, but this is what is being shared in the press. When you look at the economic disruption, it means tenants can't go to work. It means neighbors who can't use their buildings. It potentially means people don't have a home, and it leaves businesses who don't have workers. The financial consequences land on all of society. And finally, we want a resilient society, but we can't have that if our buildings are not operational after an earthquake. If you can't go back into your building after an earthquake, it's a disposable building. So yes, through the building code provisions, we get people safely out, but can we get them back in to a functional building? So this is a topic that's being discussed, and I have two experts with me today to help us answer some uh, thought-provoking questions that I've prepared. So first we have Mike Mahoney, and he is with FEMA, and he refers to himself as the FEMA earthquake guy. So we'll remember him that way. And then Jonathan Sue, who is a principal engineer and building official for the city of Seattle, and has been involved in the development and enforcement implementation of seismic code provisions for many years. So welcome, and thank you for joining us. All right, so first question is, when did you first hear about functional recovery? The term functional recovery is a little odd. I've been working for it now, with it for many years, but I can remember when I first heard it and how it relates to seismic design. Let's listen to how Mike and John first heard about it. Well, I first heard it through the work of the immediate occupancy workshop. And it was David Bonowitz who first taught me all about functional recovery. So, 
So you're actually right. There have been several terms floating around. I, I think it started. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> it's scary. Um, uh, I think it started with resiliency. It's uh, probably the first term that got floated around. The problem with that term is it means something different to everybody. It never really had a definition that I think everybody bought into. It, that kind of morphed into immediate occupancy, as Susan said. Um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology put, put, put on a workshop a couple of years ago on immediate occupancy. That term also had its own problems. You know, what's immediate? Does everything have to be immediate, or can some classes of buildings be less than immediate? Um, and it was at that workshop, I agree, that was the first time I heard the term functional recovery as well. Um, and that's kind of taken on, I think, a better life, or a life of its own, that that people are kind of latching onto and agree with. It, um, uh, and, and I think it's got legs, as they say, so I will leave it at that. Okay, I only heard about it uh, in the last year or so as a term itself. Yes, we talked about immediate occupancy. I was at that workshop as well uh, a couple of years ago, and I don't remember hearing <laughs> it being used at that, at that workshop. Uh, the concept has certainly been around for a while. Um, you know, we have uh, uh, San Francisco has their spur. Um, I forget what it's a committee or a group uh, that that has promoted the, the, the idea. Uh, Washington State also had a, put together a resilience uh, committee. It's actually the Resilient Washington State, they called it, they have a report out that does uh, something very similar. So it's a concept, we've been talking about it for a while. Oh, sorry, that, that, con that report was out uh, 2012. So it's been a long, it's been a while, again, so concept-wise, and the term it by itself, yeah, just within the last year plus. Okay, great. All right, so now the next, I'm not, I'm not giving you a grade. They keep calling me their teacher and that these are tough questions, but anyhow, you guys did excellent, thank you. Okay, number two, how would you describe functional recovery to a fifth grader? So, so if you're the teacher, that means we're in the fifth grade class. <laughs> um, I would describe it as having a building go through some sort of an event, whether it's an earthquake or something else, and basically being able to get back, go back in that building and resume whatever function the building you had, whether it's your home, whether it's your business, whether it's where you go shopping, um, that the function can be recovered within a certain period of time um, with, with a reasonable amount of, of, of repair effort um, within that time. That was terrible, sorry. Um, fortunately, Susan uh, let us think about this ahead of time, so I, I do have some, some notes written down. But um, I have to say that there's not an agreed upon definition, even among the adults working on this. We're still trying to figure out exactly what does it mean. Uh, does it mean that there is some damage, or does it mean that you are fully, fully recovered? Uh, it's still kind of out there. Um, I think most people are, uh, from what I can tell in our committee that's working on this, is uh, leaning toward there's some level of damage. But so, so I would uh, say um, that uh, if there's been, I would try to tell a fifth grader, if it's been, there's been a really big earthquake, which is kind of the focus of this, um, if there's been a really big earthquake, it's possible to do whatever you were doing in that building before the earthquake. That's kind of the, the essence of it. Uh, there may be uh, some, you may have to have some workarounds, some other ways of doing things, but essentially you can do the same functions. Okay, great. Yes, and I, and I asked these tough questions because these are things that I spent time thinking about and I thought that in order to really bring home the point of functional recovery, to hear how we're describing it, and we're in the process of being able to message functional recovery consistently to the public. And an important point that sets it apart from the rest is that it is a function of time. So we're talking about, okay, how is your building able to be used the way it was used before an earthquake? Yes, but did it take you two weeks? Did it take you two months? Did it take a year? That's a predefined amount of time for functional recovery. So that's what sets it apart from everything else. I mean, I think immediate occupancy 
is a type of functional recovery where you're able to have the building function immediately after an earthquake. But then you've got these other different options depending upon if you select two weeks, two months, or a year. Okay, is functional recovery applicable to new construction or existing construction? Yes. Um, no, I think it's applicable to both. Obviously, it's much easier to do with new construction because you're controlling the design at, at, at that stage, and, and whatever improvements you're making are far cheaper to do on paper than, than after the fact. But I think there also is a, a role for functional recovery in existing buildings, um, especially given whatever that occupancy is. In other words, for example, if it's a hospital or some critical facility, absolutely, I think it needs to come into play. Um, a little less so for uh, normal occupancy buildings, but uh, the, you know, depending on what the owner wants to do with that building, I think there's a role there as well. I think Mike said the operative word. I was uh, had a boss a couple uh, several years ago who said the perfect government government answer to any question is it depends. And um, this, I don't think it's any exception. It kind of depends what people want. I think you, you, we can certainly. Uh, make standards for new buildings that's a little easier as Mike said to implement but I think uh, there are possibilities uh, to be addressed within the existing building side as we're certainly trying to do that with uh, you know California has made a lot of um, uh, progress on retrofitting buildings for seismic uh, I have to say the rest of the country including Washington State is lagging behind that significantly but um, there I just read a report actually uh, oddly within the last uh, week uh, from the Swiss Re Institute and it's called a decade of major earthquakes and lessons for business and one of the things they point out is that non-structural damage is actually the leading cause of business business interruption after disasters it's not the structure uh, structure generally ride things out okay it's the, all the other stuff that goes around it so if you have an earthquake in your um, suspended ceiling falls down now you've got a business uh, interruption, or if uh, your sprinkler heads get knocked off by something else, again, you've got a business interruption. So um, I think we could uh, apply it to, uh, or functional recovery to, uh, or get better functional recovery in, in existing buildings by uh, possibly paying a little more attention to these uh, non-structural pieces. So you think I should grab the uh, so what I uh, now have uh, on the screen is a matrix, and this is what is a starting point, where we have a matrix with a building use and with the recovery time. So on the left side there for building category, I just have listed there one, two, three, four, and we would define those building categories, let's say if we were to see something like this in the code. So it may be that residences would be category one, offices would be category two, uh, schools would be category three, and hospitals uh, and essential facilities would be category four. And then, you know what, I think I just had that flipped around. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. You were listening. Oh yeah, I was thinking of the code, yes. So flip that around because at the top there, you can see for category one, we want to have 90% functional recovery or immediate occupancy, so to speak, uh, immediately. And then as we move down in the occupancy use, we see that functional recovery will take place at longer durations. So I just wanted to put this up as a matrix because I'm really hoping that we see something more official. This is something that I just whipped together. Um, and it is definitely a step in the roadmap to getting to seismic functional recovery. That's not a question, so you guys get to relax for a second here. Okay, all right. So um, this right here is just an illustration, uh, or some pictures from the Anchorage earthquake where there was a building where the wall separated from the roof. And that is not something uncommon with uh, construction pre-1980. And in this case, you can see that uh, there is a uh, red tag that indicates that it cannot be occupied, that it needs to have shoring in order to gain access to the building. 
So there is some function as far as getting someone into the building and getting everything out, and then there would need to be some more repair in order to get additional function of the building to go in there and make it functional again. So just wanted to show that as an illustration, it also indicated that no parking was permitted uh, at the problem area. So there were portions of this building that were able to be occupied, and then this portion of the building was not able to be occupied. And there were some uh, steps that needed to be taken in order to get it reoccupied. So there's some levels of functional recovery in there as you think about that. Uh, the Ridgecrest earthquake on the left there is Home Depot. This is kind of an interesting story. I went out, out to Ridgecrest after the earthquake, and the first thing I thought I would do, because I had no idea what I was doing, it just so happened I was driving through Ridgecrest the day after the uh, 7.1 earthquake. So I thought, oh, I'm going to go to Home Depot because I'm going to start talking to the patrons and they're going to tell me where to go to find all the damage. So I went to the Home Depot, they were very tight-lipped, I couldn't find out any information, except I finally was able to talk to an employee and I said, you know, it looks like you guys had no damage, I'm always curious about the storage racks and how everything's going to become, come tumbling down in an earthquake. And he said, yeah, we had 50 people here last night cleaning up the aisles, it was a total mess but we were able to uh, open up the store uh, at the regular hours. And so on the left there, you can see that the paint spilled, and so they weren't able to open up that aisle. But uh, that was a pretty good functional recovery as far as the day after the earthquake, Home Depot was open. Now that center slide right there is a Rite Aid, and uh, they had suspended ceilings falling down and all sorts of things coming off the shelf, but they were able to remain functional as far as their pharmacy. They had a drive through window, and that sign there says that the store is closed except for the drive through pharmacy window. So that is an illustration where, let's say, 30% functional recovery uh, within a week after the earthquake. And then finally there, on the right-hand side, is a drive through I got real hungry when I was in Ridgecrest. Nothing was open, uh, but the Burger King drive through was, but you couldn't actually go into the Burger King because they had too much uh, non-structural interior damage. So just wanted to show these illustrations to kind of get you thinking in the terms of seismic functional recovery. So now back to our questions. All right, so... Fun so functional recovery is something that is mentioned uh, pretty strongly, right? Mentioned isn't the right word. Pointedly, pointedly required. Okay, we're gonna get there, we're building to that. All right, so it's, it is addressed. We'll say functional recovery is addressed in the 2018 MEHER Reauthorization Act. Some of you in the audience may not know what that is. So we have the FEMA earthquake guy here to tell us today. Well, where do I start? Um, NEHERP is a National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program. Uh, we actually call it NEHERP. Uh, that is actually a program of four federal agencies, FEMA, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is the lead agency, the U.S. Geological Survey, and the National Science Foundation. Um, all federal programs, or almost all federal programs, are, are actually authorized only for a period of time. Five years is kind of the average, that's what it was with Neher. Um, so the 2018 reauthorization, that program had lost its authorization. Congress reauthorized it in 2018. That authoriz authorization allows another part to appropriate funds to the four agencies for them to do the work required under the program. So the 2018 Neher Reauthorization Act was Congress reauthorizing that program for us to do the work. That five year cycle allows Congress to tweak the program and make changes that they want to see done by the four agencies and this is obviously one of them. That's great. That's your question. That was your question. Okay, excellent. Yes. Okay, here we go now. That was that was a great brief overview. I know that was tough to do. So now that we all know what the NEHRP Reauthorization Act is, how does it address functional recovery? 
So, there is a section number five in the Reauthorization Act uh, that was actually there before, and it, and it required uh, the four agencies to be involved in the development and maintaining of seismic standards. That section was rewritten to require FEMA and NIST to prepare a report to be submitted back to Congress um, that would outline a series of options that could be used to encourage functional recovery. So essentially, the act mandates that FEMA and NIST by next June uh, submit a report to Congress on what is functional recovery, what options exist to, to um, encourage it to be used. Excellent. Yes, I would just add that that, that, that uh, report uh, needs to address the built environment, including life loads. Yes, okay. And it so happens that John and I are on the, the NIST-FEMA Functional Recovery Work Group, and your role, you're not a member, are you? You're kind of like a facilitator leader? Ex officio, okay. And so he was saying that the report is due June 2020. So that's very quickly. I mean, that's, yeah. So we have a lot of work. We're going to have our third meeting next week. So this is real. It's happening. And we want to get the message out. Okay. Does the IBC currently have provisions that provide for functional recovery? I'm going to give this to John because uh, I can see it, the time is such that maybe one person right now for a question. Yeah. Um, to some degree, yes, the IBC does, does uh, require that for uh, risk category three and four buildings, so your uh, hospitals and, and um, fire stations, police stations, those critical facilities. Uh, and larger facilities have to be designed to higher standards that theoretically uh, get you better performance. It's not it, not a direct connection, uh, but it, 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 we think it will do that. Uh, there's also uh, performance-based design is available through ASCE 7 and through uh, the IBC, so you can go to a performance-based design and try to pick your performance level and go that direction. It's optional at this stage for, uh, for most buildings. Thank you, John. Yeah, I'd like to. Oh, I like to always remind people that the code is an absolute minimum. Absolute minimum. So you can always do more. And I've heard recently in this functional recovery conversation the phrase "code knobs." So you can turn up the knob for your importance factor, or you can turn up the knob for your drift that you use the maximum drift. So there's certain things that you can do to increase your functional recovery performance, but it is more than the minimum. Are there plans to change the IBC or another I code to further address functional recovery? Where's our crystal ball, right? Where's our crystal ball? Um, I think we're waiting for that report, June 2020 for the options. There's nothing preventing anybody from submitting a code change for functional recovery for the 2024 IBC. So I'm gonna say that, do you have to add? I do know that uh, ASCE 7, uh, that's the design standard for those who don't know, uh, is making improvements on the non-structural side. There have been several um, changes that have been made in this, in the, for the 16 version the 2016 version, and I suspect there will be more uh, being submitted for the 2022 version. So uh, they're trying to improve, again, performance, I think, in the non-structural side. Just, just to add one thing, if we can. <laughs> um, so let's back up a second. Functional recovery is not just having a building that's going to be uh, give you performance such that you're going to be able to walk back into that building and, and resume your function. Um, it's more than just a building. As Susan said, it's also the lifelines or the services that support that building. So if you have a building that, that performs perfectly, you walk back in, you know, and you're able to, to, to resume your function, but you have no water, you have no power, you have no sewage service, um, that's not a functionally recovered building. Um, so it's more than just the building and the building code, it's also the lifelines that support that building. Um, so the, the, I, I think the standard that's gonna come out of this, or guidance that may become a standard, 
is going to go beyond the building code and also address the lifelines that, that, that service that building, um, but from that build, from the aspect of that building. So it'll be interesting to see how that, 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 that carries out. I think there will be some tweaks that happen to the IBC and the other I codes as we learn more, but I see really functional recovery being a separate standard that maybe it becomes an appendix, maybe it becomes its own code, who knows? Um, it's just really kind of as to see how this all evolves. We're at the beginning of the journey, right? Yes. Are communities supportive of the idea, idea of a functional recovery design standard? Perfect government answer. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, certain communities are, certain pol uh, political leaders are. I, it's hard to tell about the community as a whole. You know, if you talk to you know your average uh, person, they probably don't know what they're getting right now. That's kind of the, the problem. Uh, they think they've got earthquake-proof buildings. You see that occasionally. Uh, so they don't know what they're getting right now. Uh, would they support more? They probably would say so until they have to start chilling out the dollars. And that's, I think, part of our problem is that we are very focused as a, um, so what are I, I can't think of the word. Um, we're very focused on first costs, uh, upfront costs, not thinking long term uh, as, a, as a group. So I think that's, that's something we have to address. We have to, uh, in some ways, create the demand for that. I mean, in other societies, that there's a demand for performance and they get it because the, the public demands it. I don't think we have that same push yet. Yeah, absolutely, I totally agree. Um, the only thing I would add to that is, I think a community has to go through a disaster to understand what they're getting now, and, and it's those communities that have that now have that awareness that uh, probably are more receptive to this. Great answers, those are thought-provoking. Okay, so uh, this is our last question. Uh, what can the code community do to bring awareness to the situation? A talk like this, right? And you going, taking this information and sharing it. ICC and Calvo did a uh, seismic roundtable in July, and we do have a report that's been issued with the results from that full day event. And so that would be something to share with your community. And uh, we will be uh, continually pushing out information as it develops on this topic. So, uh, in light of this question, do you have any closing comments that you would like to share? I, I think a big part of, especially this answer, is it, it, the, the, the public needs to be aware of what they're getting now. And, and I don't think, generally, they are. Um, as, as John said, you know, people out there think they're, they're what, what they're getting now is, is the perfect building's gonna resist all, all types of hazards, and that's not the case. Um, so really, it's, it's, it, it's uh, as I like to say, it's top down, but it's also bottom up. We have to educate the public as to what they're getting, uh, and, and if that's what they want, fine, or if they're expecting something more, then something more needs to be done. And from the top down, we just you know, we need to work within the code um, uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, give them the product that they're looking for. I would say yeah, talks like this, going and talking with your local uh, stakeholders, the, AIAs, the BOMAs of the world out there, um, you know, and, and make getting people aware of it. Uh, certainly, the media can get involved. I, I, I'm careful about getting them involved in it because they can paint an entirely different picture than you want. Um, I, I cringe a little bit that um, you know we don't want to give the impression that what we're doing right now is wrong and that it's unsafe. So it's, it's walking that fine line and being able to give the message that we can do better than what we've got, not necessarily that what we're doing is bad. Um, and then, uh, you know, there are examples of people making bad choices. And, you know, you can't help that. Um, we had a public agency come to us and ask for waivers on, on, um, on their construction because they were so important to the economy they couldn't spend the money up front. I'm going, this does not make sense. If you're so important in the economy and an earthquake happens in Seattle, then where are you going to be? Right? So um, anyway, there's, there's lots of examples like that. that you know, people make bad choices. And you can try to educate them as much as possible, but right now uh, we don't have the, uh, the um, requirements to make them do anything better.
right, I can see that we're at the end of our time limit. So, uh, Osama, I'm, let's see, the next speaker is here, right? Yes, so we don't want to encroach on your time. So, Osama, if you wouldn't mind, we can meet with you on the side. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And please feel free to reach out to any of us for questions. We'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much.